Our event tonight is featuring Thomas Zerbucken, the Distinguished Associate Administrator of NASA Science Mission Directorate and former U of M College of Engineering professor. I'm Mike Pearson. I'm a graduate of the College of Engineering and a board member of the DC Club for the University of Michigan Alumni Association. And I'm also the proud father of two boys who would love to be astronauts and go to Mars. And in connection with a boy who wanted to go to Mars, I'd love to introduce Dr. Alec D. Gallimore, the Robert G. Vlasic Dean of Engineering for the U of M College of Engineering. He is also director of the NASA-funded Michigan Space Grant Consortium and director of the Michigan Air Force Center of Excellence in Electric Propulsion. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2019. Dean Gallimore, thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn this over to you. Greetings, and glad to be in the presence of so many wonderful DC Wolverines. Go Blue! Thanks, Mike. I appreciate this opportunity. I'll take a few minutes to provide a couple of updates on the College of Engineering overall, uh, touch on some of our rec recent efforts in space. Uh, first of all, I don't have to tell you how much 2020 has been an amazingly robust year and just a challenge in so many fronts. Unfortunately, it has consumed our time because of the two pandemics we face. One, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic, but the other is the pandemic associated with racial and social conflict unrest. The University of Michigan certainly doesn't want to be a host to either of these pandemics or viruses. We're working hard as leaders to create an environment in our that educates and protects our community regarding both. Regarding the first pandemic, COVID-19, as you know, the university opted for a hybrid in-person online model this fall. About 75% of our undergraduate credit hours are remote. Our residence hall densities are down to about two thirds of their capacity. And I'm proud to announce that there've been no massive outbreaks on our campus. We're tracking it daily through an app that has not only uh, who's being tested on campus, but also throughout the uh, county. And our positivity rates well, uh, remain well below 5%. Meanwhile, our year-to-year -year enrollment is roughly flat, which is these days the new up. The second pandemic, systematic uh, racism and unconscious bias is something I wanna talk about as well. In June of this year, I shared some thoughts with the campus community. I say that leadership demands discomfort. I challenge our community of leaders and best to take action, to learn about racism as you would for any complex phenomena worth learning about, and to reach out to a colleague from a different background and to work to understand how we as individuals can and should make a difference. Since that time, I've charged five teams to develop proposals that will be at the centerpiece of our Michigan engineering strategic culture pillar moving forward. Our aim is that every member of our engineering community will gain a better understanding about diversity, equity, inclusion, beginning with a focus on race and ethnicity. Now you might wanna ask, why would you start there? To use an analogy my college aged daughter shared with me, when the firefighters show up to a neighborhood, they naturally focus on the house on fire, not because it's the most important house in the neighborhood, but it, because it's the house that needs attention and ignoring it will threaten all of the other houses. Both of these major efforts have been examples of living our values, our Michigan engineering values, such as transparency and trustworthiness, diversity, equity, and social impact. Another value is creativity, innovation, and daring, which we call CID for short. CID is well represented in a major research thrust that is one of my passions, space. We have benefited greatly from strong partnerships with NASA in several projects. In fact, this fiscal year, the College of Engineering is receiving over $22 million of funding for research from NASA. I'm gonna offer just a few examples of some major projects supported by NASA. SUNRISE, which stands for Sun Radio Interferometer Space Experiment, is a new $63 million mission that's led by the University of Michigan and funded by NASA to study how the sun's radiation affects the environment for spacecraft and astronauts. Sunrise will offer a never seen before glimpse at what goes on in the area above the sun's surface known as the solar corona. Miniature satellites called CubeSats will form a virtual telescope in space. 
to detect and study the radio waves preceding major solar events. Sunrise is expected to launch in 2023. Now to space weather forecasting. Torrents of charged particles and electromagnetic fields from the sun can damage power lines and satellites and threaten the health of our astronauts. University of Michigan faculty members lead two projects recently announced. The next gen space weather modeling framework is funded by the National Science Foundation, aims to accurately predict solar storms and coronal mass ejections a full day in advance versus about one hour of lead time that we have right now. This forecasting can help us avoid complications for power grids and GPS reliant technology, and also plays a critical capability as we send humans beyond low Earth orbit back to the moon this decade and to Mars in the 2030s. Ether, funded by NASA, aims to improve models of Earth's upper atmosphere to let scientists observe at scale and detail simultaneously. This project will help students and postdocs to learn the models by hosting summer schools and creating educational materials. And finally, the University of Michigan Space Institute, or UMSI as we call it, launched just a year ago in the presence of our keynote speaker and the NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine. UMSI is all about the future of space research, advancing our global leadership. Our aim is to have a representation, representation from all Michigan engineering departments, plus the physical sciences and the behavioral sciences and more in UMSI. Of course, the Institute also will support education, such as our robust satellite built CubeSat program, I mean, student built CubeSat program, where learners follow the design build test and fly approach and community engagement events, such as seminars, symposia, even camps. As a member of the space research community myself, I'm proud and excited about these developments, as well as the many other developments at the university. I hope you are too. Thank you for your support and as always go blue. It is now my sincere pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. As NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Director, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin is tasked with helping us answer some of humanity's biggest questions. Where do we come from? Are we alone? How does the universe work? No pressure, Thomas, no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> He's responsible for NASA's science strategy, including building partnerships with industry and other nations. Dr. Zerbuchen earned his doctoral degree in physics from the University of Bern in Switzerland. His honors include membership in the International Academy of Astronautics. He's a recipient of the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal and just became a fellow of the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. Thomas and I had the pleasure of working together close on projects at the University of Michigan where he was a professor of space science and aerospace engineering and the founding director of the University of Michigan Center for Entrepreneurship, launched at Michigan Engineering, which became a central part of U of M's top ranked undergraduate entrepreneurship program nationally. Please welcome my dear friend, Thomas Zerbuka. Hey, thanks so much, uh, Alec. I hope you can hear me okay. Is that okay? Yes, we can. Uh, I'm just so glad to be here and, uh, and uh, to be part of this uh, discussion we're going to have. And I am excited to talk to you about uh, some of the important science that we're doing. And I think what I wanted to do is just uh, show uh, like four or five slides before we go launch into that discussion and kind of really tell you a story. And of course, it's a go blue story. It's a Michigan story. And, uh, and uh, it starts, uh, if you don't mind uh, uh, pick it, uh, pulling up the slides, uh, by the way, this is me, and uh, here's the title page of our calendar uh, that is there, uh, kind of this uh, uh, young daughter of one of our uh, leaders uh, walking through this store. I just love this picture. That's what exploration is all about, right? Insight into new worlds and kind of uh, imagining uh, worlds that are there, whether it's on moon, whether it's Mars, whether it's elsewhere. And so basically what I'd like to tell you is, is that story and uh, really a story that combines the two uh, things my life has really been about so much besides family and uh, friendships and so forth, but my professional life has been about science and it has been about education. And the next slide uh, is uh, really uh, the next, uh, sorry, this slide, of course, uh, is to introduce kind of how we're uh, thinking about 
science. So first of all, science is really for us about two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, frankly, discovering the secrets of the universe. You know, you could say, well, well that, that seems, you know, disjointed from the world. Why do I care about it? I would just want to say, and I think many of us who have benefited from education, such as the ones from the University of Michigan, understand, of course, that research of the universe, research of the inner world, whether it's biology, whether it's uh, uh, psychology, whether it's uh, in humanities, but also natural science, uh, is discovering the secrets of the universe not only teaches us more about the world around us or in us, but it also really shapes how we think. It sets the space in which we think in. And so for me, being part of NASA and running NASA science program, which of course is the best and uh, most relevant kind of program for science in and from space uh, in both in the past, which is not because of me, of course, because of the many people that came ahead of us. Our goal is to, of course, maintain that. Uh, discovering the secrets of the universe is really one of the most uh, exciting things we could be doing as humans. There's one question that has been addressed among the many uh, broad questions that you talked about, Alec. Uh, uh, you know, is uh, searching for life elsewhere. And uh, that's a question that, of course, for millennia, uh, we talked about, you know, philosophers talked about, but we're really making progress towards that with the tools of science. And I'm going to talk about one specific mission. There's one thing, and, uh, you know, Rosina Bierbaum was here, and we're going to talk about that, is, is, of course, just as passionate as I am and many others, which is, that uh, much of what we're doing in space uh, not only teaches us about the universe itself or the, the earth, but it helps protect and improve life on earth and in space. Now, I want to tell you that we're not, NASA is not responsible for making weather forecasts uh, or providing the data that uh, uh, USGS uh, you know, is doing or other agencies, but we are building the spacecraft that are up there and being used for uh, NOAA and, and uh, also international and in, you know instruments on international missions. So this morning, of course, uh, if you looked at the forecast, you should know that a significant fraction of the forecast scale uh, on your phone or however you looked at, of course, was utilizing a spacecraft that's flying over you, uh, GOES, uh, east, if you're on the east coast. And uh, that is one of the spacecraft. In fact, the first spacecraft that I I was in charge of the launch. Uh, by the way, side note, uh, Alec, you know, uh, four managers, instrument manager of that uh, uh, spacecraft for Michigan grad. So it was a, a huge surprise to me. It just uh, really brought it uh, together. Just an amazing uh, thing. So that's what we're doing. Uh, next slide. How are we doing it? And uh, we talk, we, we, uh, you, you talk to us about uh, missions. Uh, and here's the missions, and no, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but you get an idea. See, so many of them in green are focused around on the Earth, uh, our oceans, uh, the, uh, you know, the atmosphere, uh, the cryosphere, uh, the, the, you know, really looking at the Earth as a system. The best way of doing that is, in fact, from space, right, uh, uh, interwoven with others. Uh, you also see missions that are looking at, in astrophysics there at the top left in blue. You know, some of your friends there are maybe the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the James Webb uh, Telescope that we're getting ready uh, for. You saw the story today that we just finished the environmental tests, which is a huge milestone, two decades in the making, longer than it should have taken. It's a discussion we can talk about. And also there uh, around the sun heliophysics, and you see there at around 10 o'clock of the sun, you see the sunrise mission. Uh, you also see, of course, the Parker Solar Probe, which has an in, a Michigan instrument on it, and then Solar Orbiter, uh, which is also uh, in part a Michigan instrument uh, on it. Uh, wind, uh, by the way, right underneath it there at, at, at uh, noon or whatever, uh, is an instrument that uh, the first that I helped build uh, with my own hands. Uh, so there's other things there, and I want to talk uh, to about uh, the uh, really um, uh, one uh, story now, and I'm going to go to that story. Next slide. So uh, what I want to talk about is really a story about Joan and the pixel capacitor. And it's like, uh, who is Joan and what's the pixel and what's a capacitor? Well, let's tell you the story. It's really a, a story in three acts. And of course, uh, next slide, it starts at Michigan. 
And uh, no, this is not Michigan, but what you should see here is Joan. You see there with the uh, red shirt, uh, there she stands and uh, next to Trisha with a, a green shirt and Kelly on the right. Uh, and that's the leadership team that actually took a whole mission, a kind of a capstone uh, class uh, to Africa to set up uh, internet connectivity to uh, uh, of uh, villages uh, uh, and really to learn, actually together in collaboration with Google, uh, how to do that. And, and by the way, they were the leaders of the team, uh, selected by the teams and, uh, and uh, to be the leaders and, uh, and uh, just really great. That's how, how I met Joan. She was sat in my class that did that, a space system class of the type that uh, uh, you talked about earlier, uh, Alec. Um, so, so that's uh, kind of the first act. This is Joan at class uh, uh, with us. And that, of course, I know about her leadership uh, and her, her skill. Uh, the next one, next slide, is related to Mars 2020. It's uh, the next generation rover. It's on the way to Mars right now. And there's an instrument that's hanging from that most sophisticated arm that's called Pixel. It's an X-ray spectrometer. And we could talk a lot about this, but you should know that, you know, if, uh, 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 there, there we really struggled with building that X-ray spectrometer for a variety of reasons. And one of the key reasons for that, next slide, was the capacitor. Now, so if you look at this test flow, uh, frankly, I met, and this is uh, the second act of it, I met uh, uh, Joan. Uh, by the way, whenever I travel, I tend to uh, tell on social media, tell of my former students and friends, where I'm at and, uh, uh, you know, often we go for a drink. So I remember uh, distinctly uh, Joan sitting on the other side of the table for me, super tired. And she talked about that uh, capacitor. By the way, she didn't have to talk about it. I knew about it because it worried me to no end. There was a capacitor on a power uh, supply in this test screen. And no, I will not talk about all of these boxes. But in this test flow, really late, we figured out that one of those capacitors was leaking and kind of emptying its asset onto the board. And uh, frankly, we worry tremendously because whenever you go to Mars, you need to hit the window, you cannot be late. And so for me, uh, what I was so excited to learn is shown basically uh, working with her team on that capacitor in really taking advantage and, and utilizing the in-depth knowledge that she got uh, from the University of Michigan and the teamwork uh, within the University of Michigan to really solve that technical problem that, frankly, I worried about as the associate administrator. Uh, out of the 105 or so missions, this is what I spent uh, meetings on because we needed to get beyond where we were. The next slide shows her with her team uh, sitting there, uh, and I, I believe uh, this was at 3 a.m., uh, uh, she told us at 3 a.m. Uh, she stood there and working with that team and kind of catching up with testing. Why did she look so tired? Because she worked with that team uh, with it. And, and, and I just uh, I need to say uh, uh, that uh, team uh, did uh, really amazing work. They all have names, right? Uh, not all of them are uh, Michigan grads. Jennifer uh, Drosper was uh, currently running uh, the entire uh, frankly, uh, uh, operations preparation as we're flying towards Mars to make sure that all the software is there. Christina, you know, Stephanie, uh, and Elise, you know, they're all here uh, together with uh, Joan. And next slide. Yes, uh, it was uh, July 30th when I was in uh, uh, Kennedy. We also, all, all of us struggle with COVID, but we were there and I needed to be there, and uh, here is the picture that I saw, just uh, kind of almost life-changing uh, experience of that rocket uh, taking off. But what I, uh, you know, what I noticed when I was there, kind of two days earlier arrived, I noticed that Sean was also in Florida. She had taken uh, the family down, and I, you know, I uh, basically said, hey, why don't we, you know, figure out whether you can join us uh, to this, and here is the next picture. Here's Joan here, uh, left of me, you see in the gray uh, Mars shirt, the one that I have on right now to honor her and her team uh, uh, that, that did this uh, together uh, with Danielle, uh, by the way, another uh, Michigan grad that also happened to be down there. And, uh, and uh, you know, so uh, 
you know, really celebrating uh, this work. By the way, Danielle's uh, husband uh, was there at the integration test, was actually the person who said, we're ready to launch kind of at, uh, at, at the completion of the integration. So what I'd like to do is just frankly, uh, have you turn off the slide and then uh, uh, really uh, kind of actually go uh, to the final discussion. So why am I telling you that story? Uh, the first of all, what I want to tell you is how hopeful I am uh, learning from the experiences at NASA about what we can do to really help this planet both understand what it's doing, but also solve very hard problems such as that capacitor problem. But what I'm equally excited about is that so many of the people that are working with there, and at this moment in time, Joan, I'd like you to turn on your camera. I asked her whether she would want to join me and just kind of tell you how it looked from your end, kind of how your that Michigan experience set you up for this uh, almost miracle uh, that you pulled off together with your team uh, on Pixel. So Joan, can you take over? Sure, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. I can't see you right now, but I can hear you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Thomas, what was key for me in uh, achieving success with the Pixel story as just one honestly small example um, was that it's not just dependent on, you know, being able to solve math problems or model physics or things like that, but, you know, real world problem solving requires me and all of us, right, to be able to make decisions while also weighing the risk to success and being able to perform under high pressure situations. And so if I think back to my time at Michigan, right, the picture you showed of uh, me out in Africa and being one of the leaders of the class, that was uh, one situation where we were faced with um, having to make decisions without all the information we'd want to have on hand and high pressure and stress. That was one situation. Another example I can think of was, you know, we had this 100 hour exam um, that you gave the class to take where we had to design all subsystems of a spacecraft and the full constellation of, I think, 100 or so satellites. And we had to do that all within 100 hours, including sleeping and eating time. And so um, those are just two small examples of basically being under these types of conditions where you're stressed out, you don't have enough information, you're forced to work with challenging personalities, maybe with the people or different you know, perspectives, the people you're working with. And, and that's what I face every day at work, right? And especially in the pixel capacitor situation where those types of environments that are, I guess some consider these soft skills that go beyond the technical depth, but um, you know, I really needed those skills combined with the technical training to be able to be successful. So Joan, can you just tell us quickly where you grew up, uh, what your education is at Michigan and where you work now and what you do today? Uh, this spacecraft is on the way to Mars, go ahead. Yeah, sure, I grew up in Howell, Michigan um, and I graduated from U of M in 07 with my BS in aerospace and then 08 with my master's in space systems. And uh, after I actually transitioned off Mars 2020 um, earlier this year and now I'm on a project called Psyche, and I'm the lead payload systems engineer on that mission, which is a mission out to the an asteroid called Psyche. Thank you so much, uh, Alec. One of your graduates. <laughs> Thanks so much, John, for joining us. Uh, I'm, you know, chime in as we go forward. I really appreciate that, and you know, together with uh, so many of the graduates that I've met in this position, I'm just so proud of what you've achieved and what you're doing uh, for the agency, but also for the nation and for all of us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think with that, I would turn it over back to you, uh, uh, Alec. Thanks. I think uh, we're going to turn over to Peck, I think. Uh, that, right? that sounds good. How about that? That sounds <laughs> good, Alec. You know, it's uh, one of those things that uh, the era of COVID, uh, it's always great to see other people even if it's only on Zoom. And it's wonderful to see Wolverines wherever you are. Uh, I'm pretty new to the Wolverine family, uh, coming to Michigan uh, three years ago now. 
Uh, but I did grow up in Michigan and got married in Michigan. And I had to put this picture in the background just to make you all jealous because I am back in Michigan enjoying when I can Lake Michigan. Uh, I uh, also, like everyone else, it sounds like, wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up. Uh, and uh, in my office, if you don't believe me, you can see a note from Ed White, um, who I was really happy to hear uh, when I arrived here was an alum of the University of Michigan as well. And of course, Ed was uh, one of the astronauts who died with Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee in 67 uh, and the disaster of Apollo 1. Um, but he was someone who encouraged me to work hard and grow up to be an astronaut. And uh, I'll always remember that. I ended up not being an astronaut, but I'm a climate scientist. So here I am. Uh, we're going to talk a little about climate science. We're going to, of course, talk a lot about space science as well. Um, we've already been introduced to Alec and Thomas. I enjoyed your presentation, Thomas. Uh, we also have with us uh, Deborah Factor. Uh, who is responsible for leading Airbus US's space systems, uh, which includes managing the national security space and space exploration line of business in the US. Uh, she's a member of Airbus One Web Satellites Board. Uh, and prior to Airbus US, she was Vice President and General Manager of Strategic Operations for Ball Aerospace, uh, leading the company's Washington DC operations, strategic development, marketing communications. We've got a lot of heavy hitters on the line today. Um, she's actively engaged as an advisor and mentor in the aerospace industry, as a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronomics. Nomic, ah, astronautics. Uh, these things don't roll off my tongue as a climate scientist, I apologize. Um, and an uh, academician of the International Academy of Astronomics uh, as well. And of course, what makes her even more special to all of us is that she has a bachelor's and master's degree from aeros in aerospace engineering from, yes, you guessed it, the University of Michigan. I'd also like to introduce our other guest, uh, who I know a little better, uh, Rosina Bierbaum, uh, who is a professor in the uh, UM School for Environment and Sustainability, where I'm the dean. And indeed, uh, Rosina uh, was a former, is a former dean of the same school. She also has an appointment in the School of Public Health at Michigan, uh, School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland as well. Um, she is uh, really well known in climate science, it's literally one of the very tippy top people in the world. Uh, she served two decades uh, in both the legislative and executive branches of the US government ran the first environmental division of the White House Office, Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSDP. Uh, she now chairs the scientific and advisory panel of the Global Environment Facility. She served on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology uh, and was an adaptation fellow at the World Bank and lead author of the US, climate, uh, US National Climate Assessment. She's also a uh, member of the US National Academy of Sciences. So she is a buff top scientist in addition to someone who translates science for policy. So I welcome both you, Deborah and uh, Rosina today. Um, and I have a number of questions <laughs> so I can stop talking and start listening again. What I'm most interested in uh, hearing, uh, starting maybe with Thomas uh, and then Alec and Deborah in particular, uh, would be, uh, what's your vision for space exploration in the next 20 to 50 years? And Rosina, just to set you up, I wanna find out what we're gonna do in the next 20 years to solve the climate crisis. So let's hear what we're doing in space and then what we're doing to uh, save the planet. Uh, do you wanna start off, Thomas? You've already said quite a bit yeah. about your own work, but I wanna know sort of what What's the take home for everyone who's going to be at that Thanksgiving dinner? What the heck is NASA going to do that's really big in the next 20 to, to 50 years? So look, I think uh, at that Thanksgiving story, there's going to be multiple elements of that story, right? I believe that uh, uh, kind of a NASA without a human exploration program that really pushes through the envelopes is not the NASA that we, our kind of the, the leaders ahead of us set up. Uh, you know, we need to continue to learn, we need to continue to uh, 
uh, you know, push the envelope and uh, in part because of technologies of the type that, uh, you know, Professor Gallimore and his team are, are working on as well as others. So the second part is we will continue to uh, explore with robots. I think the uh, searching for life elsewhere is a very exciting uh, topic, just like Mars 2020, which really has its, its uh, kind of core element to be the first leg of a round trip. Uh, uh, it's one of them. I think uh, kind of the, in 20 years, uh, I think, you know, uh, my hope is that uh, we have uh, not only uh, discovered, um, you know, the atmospheres of, of planets and other, and around other stars, but also kind of have really explored the sites of potential life around here. And, and I think there's a tremendous discovery potential that we've not materialized. But just to stick with the theme that you said, I think uh, where we have been on Earth science is, of course, Earth science has from the beginning be part of NASA, and it will be in 20 years too. I believe that, uh, that the direction we want to go is one in which kind of Earth science is uh, increasingly a partnership between commercial and international partners, because it's one Earth coming together and doing this. And it's, it has, I think, a lot more urgency uh, than uh, we had so far. It was very common in many of the products. And, uh, you know, uh, Deborah can talk about it, kind of the, the amazing work she did together with her team at Ball and others. You know, there's data that are available. We learned some things about, uh, you know, how establishing the stress on plants from space, uh, evapotranspiration, for example, just to talk about one, kind of, we can tell whether a plant is going to start dying before it does so from space because it shuts down its uh, photosynthesis and we can, we can see that. Well, so how long does it take to actually deploy that to the benefit of society, right? That so often takes decades now. And that's not good enough in a system that changes as rapidly as the earth does right now. And so I believe the, uh, the earth science will also be part of that Thanksgiving dinner story. And it will be about not only uh, the amazing things we're learning about the Earth, which we're still doing a lot of. We should not undersell uh, that. But it's also how useful it is. Just like the weather forecast today, I think uh, the long-term and regional uh, kind of uh, uh, information will really drive our thinking. To strive on this changing planet is critical. And I sure hope that it also drives policy, uh, perhaps faster than, than it does today in some cases. That's not my job. But kind of as a citizen, that's what I hope. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll hear from Rosina on how she's going to guarantee that we get that policy. Uh, Deborah, would you like to add to what you see coming ahead in the in the coming decades, two decades or more? Sure. Thanks, Jonathan uh, and Thomas. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think as we there's so much innovation happening here on earth and data that we're collecting about our own planet that is informing what we do on earth today and also what enables us to go out and explore you know you always say that there's a part of our human nature is to explore and go try new things find new things go new places and uh, space is that, is that gateway. Uh, there's always a curiosity as we send out robots, as we send out uh, uh, spacecraft that are exploring our universe and sending back data uh, into the future. And it's all about the origins of Earth from, from our past. And, you know, I... Uh, uh, it's hard to predict in 50 years, you know, I'd love to say, I think we'll have humans living in, will it be on other planets or maybe at least on other, other outposts? I think it's more likely to have uh, some gateways uh, that people can live in and thrive in. And in 50 years, that's, uh, that should be possible. And our, our train, a good training at Michigan for our engineers and scientists uh, to enable that, I think will be, uh, will be really important. And, you know, maybe there's some, um, uh, uh, you know, we always think about who has that role. Is it the government's role? Is it industry's role? Private uh, partnerships to enable the research and the, the um, technologies that, that we need. And uh, I know later we'll talk a little bit about how we will actually create a future and what data we need and who contributes to it and, and the great minds that come together across industry, government and academia. Um, I tend to think, 
I, I like thinking of a big strategic vision of what's out there and then also the practical part of how you execute, how, how we're going to uh, do and discover whatever it is we're going to do. And I guess my biggest prediction would be we have no idea what's going to happen because most likely we'll have some discovery that we don't know uh, where that will lead us. And I think that's part of the great joy of being in the aerospace industry that uh, there's always something new to be discovered that will take us somewhere that we never thought was possible. All right, well, thank you. Um, so Alec, you're my favorite rocket scientist, but I think you gotta tell me where uh, humans are going next in space. Sure, sure. Well, I think for the next 20 years, it's actually a very, I think, exciting um, set of missions that we're going to be doing. Certainly the International Space Station has been something that we've been living in space since uh, the late 1990s and we've developed a lot of capabilities to figure out how humans adapt to microgravity and things of that nature and then also how to do things like 3D print parts and just how to fix things in space and what robust technologies are needed as we want to venture out before low Earth orbit. Of course, in uh, the rest of this decades, we're going to be starting to do the exploration of the moon. Uh, our first woman and our, and our next man to land on the moon will be uh, Americans, I think, through the Artemis project. And one element of that, which I'm excited about, is the uh, Gateway Space Station, because it's a, essentially a mobile space platform that'll be around cislunar space that'll be propelled from very exotic uh, Hall current thrusters that are being developed at NASA that has heritage some of the thruster work that Thomas and I worked together. He also co-advised a number of students together that worked on this technology at Michigan. And we're really trying to, it's a precursor to Mars, it's trying to understand how do we live in space, how do we integrate uh, advanced life support systems, propulsion systems, AI, et cetera, robotics and humans working together on the moon, which is only about three or four days away. And then we're gonna get ready in the 30s to go ahead and do the big push to Mars, which is a series of cargo missions to pre-position assets throughout the, the 30s, nuclear powered uh, spacecraft. In fact, I'm a National Academy study right now to help NASA design those type of spacecraft and those missions. And then ultimately probably in the late 30s when everything is pre-positioned and ready to go, another nuclear propelled spacecraft will go ahead and, and send out the astronauts to Mars. Uh, Thomas talked about the other amazing things that we'll be doing as well in terms of looking for life in other parts of the solar system, geysers coming off of the uh, moons of the gas giants, sample return missions, looking at atmospheres and other star systems. Uh, I think Deborah alluded to the notion of industry uh, really coming to its own space industry. So things like tourism, even just the, the starting of space mining and prospecting. And then let me end by saying, let me just jump to 50 years in the future. What does it look like? I can't predict, of course, but what I can guess is that we will have an infrastructure in which we are able to sustain human life independently of the earth. Yeah. We will use uh, mining, we'll have, if water is the right propellant to be using, we'll have depots everywhere, there'll be outposts, but it won't rely on a, on, a, uh, on a chain from Earth. And then the other wild card is, what if we detect not only life somewhere else outside the Earth, primitive life or otherwise, but what if we detect advanced life through weighty waves or something like that in 50 years? That would be a very interesting proposition that would change the way we think of ourselves and our role in the universe. I agree. Well, that's a pretty comprehensive uh, charting of the history of the next 50 years. Um, Rosina, I'm going to be uh, pretty, you know, I'm going to be bold here and say we're going to be at net carbon zero, no carbon emissions by uh, 50 years from now. And I'm wondering, uh, from your perspective and all you've been doing, how do we get there? What are the most urgent areas to act on now? Um, and how do we ensure that uh, we have a workforce to do that? To save, to make the planet Earth uh, sustainable and uh, environmentally sound. Yeah, 
Well, thank you, Peck. You originally said you're only going to give me 20 years to talk about. And I guess I would like to go back to that 20 year period and just say, you know, it's really, we have a tale of two choices of two worlds that will really be determined in the next 20 years, whether or not we're on a path to that net zero and that sustainable world. I mean, it, it's so clear now that both the pace and the magnitude of climate change are such that we've got to absolutely urgently reduce emissions such that in the next decade they should be halved, that is 50% of what they are today. Uh, that's no mean feat. But also we have to adapt to the changes that are already underway and we are not coping with well. So we need to develop the next generation of mitigation technologies, um, renewables, cars, batteries, carbon capture, sequestration, satellites. And the University of Michigan is a leader at so many of these. But equally important, we have to rapidly identify options that can help us cope with the increasing extreme events, such as Hurricane Gamma, now a, a hur level four hurricane, or the um, one million acre gigaton fire in California threatening human health, food supply, livelihoods, environment. And, and to me, quite honestly, um, adaptation or resilience thinking is about two decades behind what we have done to think about mitigation and technologies. And But we really have to get on quickly with both of them. Um, and we need to ramp up solutions that can not just tackle climate change, but that also improve livelihoods, human health, create jobs and protect the environment. And climate change isn't the only problem. Um, there are these increasingly interlinked problems, you know, climate change, biodiversity, pollution. And so we can't solve them one by one anymore. We need to have a, a systems approach so that we don't avoid, as people say, transgressing planetary boundaries. You know, next year, three global treaties will be renegotiated, climate change, biodiversity, and combating desertification. And all three of them are looking for ways to do things more synergistically and in a systems way. And a lot of them looking for the role that maybe nature can help buy us time in this next decade while we're getting the next generation of mitigation technologies going. But what gives me hope is that, you know, this idea of systems thinking, which is not the way I, or I expect most of the professors on, on this call were trained. Systems thinking is something that just comes so naturally to our students so readily. They don't seem to be as kind of disciplinarily siloed as I was anyway. And, and they work in interdisciplinary groups and we welcome that here at Michigan so much. And they, they tackle real world problems. They think about solutions. They think through the environment, the policy, the economics, the justice issues. And, and we're also seeing simultaneously that industry and the investment community where there is an enormous amount of money to throw at these issues are suddenly very concerned about supply chain issues and about the resilience, if you will, of their port portfolio. So what gives me hope is one that <laughs> the problem is so, uh, so serious, but I think that the attention is so focused uh, that we may be at a tipping point, if you will, in political will. And you know, there's so much interest on campus that um, we're starting a, a climate solution certificate between the College of Engineering and SEAS so that all our grad students can be literate in climate science in mitigation and technology and in adaptation, equity and justice issues. So I think we're developing the workforce that can solve these problems and really have us on that path in the next 20 years. And we're developing the technologies here. So it gives me hope that the system thinker students we're producing will complete the tasks that our generation can't. Wow. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I think you mentioned how industry can work together. I know you mentioned <laughs> how industry can work together with academia and uh, the government to get things done. Um, I'm wondering from a, a point of view of uh, space, uh, Deborah, why don't we start with you? Uh, or Thomas, one of you guys can jump in. Um, what are the things that uh, we can do by combining uh, either international uh, US collaboration or academic business collaboration to really help us deal with the climate crisis um, soon? Uh, what are the biggest things on the horizon that you see? 
Well, it, it, you know, I might step in with something that's not exactly on the on the space side. It's on the aviation side, which is a connection that actually Airbus and University of Michigan have together. Um, is a, a, a new research um, uh, center, the Michigan Center for the Airbus Michigan Center for Aero Servo Elasticity of Very Flexible Aircraft. And you might say, well, okay, what's all that about? Um, but as many of you know, a big part of global Airbus are business and commercial aviation. And uh, this partnership was set up three years ago to look at pioneering sustainable aerospace and reducing the environmental impact and, and increasing competitiveness of aircraft. So this is something that is looking at, uh, it's a multidisciplinary design space with uh, flight physics system structures and that strategic partnership between Airbus and U of M is really looking at that whole next generation of aircraft and how they can be more efficient and particularly have a reduced impact on the environment. And the other thing that folks may have seen in the news a couple of weeks ago is um, that Airbus on the global side announced uh, an initiative to have the first zero em emission commercial aircraft by 2035. And there's three different concepts that the company is looking at with using hydrogen as a clean fuel, both as a component for a synthetic fuel and as a primary power source for commercial aircraft. And, you know, so again, making that connection of life on earth and how we make it better and how we make um, uh, transportation uh, uh, products and services that are better for the environment and uh, have a lot of innovation that can be applied to multiple other disciplines and categories. So uh, I think of that when Rosina was talking about the, and you asked about zero, uh, zero emissions, that closer to home is a big goal from, from Airbus. Uh, broader speaking is certainly on spacecraft instrument side and uh, uh, programs like Sentinel, which are detecting various um, environmental um, uh, uh, sensors, uh, climate, earth, uh, earth observation, um, weather, and getting that data from an international standpoint that contribute into even the US weather programs, the ones that European Space Agency is doing, collecting all those together from an international community. And certainly industry has the contribution of building those systems and uh, enabling the collection of the data that ultimately is used across, um, uh, across all of our governments to really inform weather, for example, and, uh, and space exploration missions. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was going to ask you, are we really going to be able to uh, fly without carbon emissions or are we going to be stuck in Zoom land for the rest of our lives? <laughs> well, thank you for answering that Yeah, that, that's, a whole, that's a whole other subject, you know, about, um, it was Alec was talking about the future travel. You know, one of the things you think about how accessible space is and it has traditionally been only for a few. And, um, uh, and, and even, even until now is, is the purview of, of governments. And with, with SpaceX having flown the first commercial crew and showing that this can have a, a you know, open up opportunities for, for individuals. And there's also a part about traveling without leaving your house. Um, what we can do through technology to experience what it's like maybe to be in space, but never leave Zoom land. Uh, when you think about artificial intelligence and um, artificial reality and what those experiences can be like. So the accessibility, the way we think about that may be very different um, and how we could have a physical experience and yet not leave home. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that. We've seen it in the gaming industry uh, and with artificial intelligence and 
creation of, of alternate um, uh, universes. So I, that's a whole other area to explore of, of how we can connect in other ways when we're not together physically. Wow, you know, I can imagine there are a lot of 15-year-old uh, out there, 15-year-old kids who would love to uh, never leave home and just play on their, uh, their games with mm -hmm. virtual reality. Um, but I think the rest of us would like to go somewhere. Thomas, uh, <laughs> I'm wondering what you think. Uh, you know, if I want to stay on the same thread, I'm wondering, uh, we're developing the capability to do, you know, suborbital and move around the planet really quickly. Uh, could we ever do that carbon free? Or uh, free, feel free to take this somewhere else if you'd like. Where are we, where is we in the U and the NASA going to work to get this done? So the answer is, I hope so, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that remain to be invented. I mean, I, you know, I, one of the reasons I wanted to bring Joan in here, and of course, with her, so many thousands of graduates, it's just like uh, Rosina said, that's where my hope is so much. Kind of our goal is to set them up because so many of the solutions at this moment in time, we, we can't formulate the questions so well yet. But is it possible to have international travel uh, carbon free? God, I hope so. There's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be the case. Uh, frankly, there's a number of technologies need to be developed that we don't have. I want to tell you a story that, uh, that really relates to uh, this kind of what's possible and, and kind of it's kind of what you would call a positive COVID story, right? So, so first of all, when the whole world kind of uh, come, you know, early April kind of started shutting down because of uh, COVID, uh, what we noticed, uh, by the way, the, the operators of our spacecraft did such a good job, the spacecraft never knew that there's COVID on, on, on Earth. So there's no bits lost and so forth. So what we did uh, is uh, we collected a record of a changing Earth in a way that we've never seen it. Right, so what do we? What, what one of the ideas that uh, was not my idea was ahead of me is is and, and it's it's national policy now and of course Rosina and her you know peers had a lot of do to do with this is that science data is public science data is collected with uh, you know NASA assets as well as other uh, national assets are public and so what happened is in COVID a few weeks in we basically recognized wow we have amazing data about this planet in a way we've never seen. And basically what we did at NASA is we actually collaborated with the European Space Agency and with JAXA to pull all of our data together for kind of a rapid kind of dashboard and feedback system. So people in their geographies could kind of collect whatever the best data are uh, to do that. Now we haven't built that out to the level that we should because it's, you know, that's a lot more work than kind of a quick hacking type of exercise that we did, but, but that's, I think, where we should go with international collaborations is to take all of our data together and learn about this planet, but also make the data useful now. And I do believe that the private sector is enormously important for that. You know, uh, many of the applications that what we're using right now that, you know, apps on our phones, kind of that entrepreneurial spirit of, uh, you know, startup entrepreneurs, but as well as you know, social entrepreneurs that really want to create solutions that are good for humanity is what's driving a lot of that progress, I would argue, in the future. But it's on the basis of, of kind of the, the role the government does have to, to kind of make sure that these data are there. And all of us together, I just really believe, that as a science community, that's a natural thing, right? We, you know, if you go to any science conference, you know, you can't really, I mean, one of the things that attracted me to science is the enormous international to scope that everything has, right? It's the same sun, it's the same earth. And we all, just like in code, we're all really together. You can't go solve a problem on one continent. It's going to go everywhere, right? Same is true with uh, all the issues that Rosina talked about. So my hope is with the people uh, that are behind us. And my hope is also with solutions that are now enabled with technologies that bring, help us pool this information and kind of really deploy it to the benefit of, of the inhabitants of this wonderful planet. Excellent. And uh, Alec, uh, I'm thinking to follow up on that. Um, at the University of Michigan, uh, is there a way we're going to be engaging more with 
the private sector, you know, SpaceX and Blue Origin, other uh, exciting new trends in space uh, technology. Um, what do you what do you think are the the big things that might be that Michigan can do to save this planet uh, <laughs> in the world of uh, space technology? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, uh, we already are doing a lot of work, of course, uh, with industry uh, and government and NASA, including SpaceX and Moon, et cetera. Uh, in fact, at one point, um, SpaceX hired more Michigan grads than um, students from any other engineering college. And in fact, my first year as dean, I visited them and had a wonderful uh, rendezvous with a number of our alums who were working there. Um, you know, it's going to take everybody involved. I mean, I think there's plenty of work and plenty of uh, need to be done. You know, I, I can't help but uh, not mention the fact of how often I see NASA caps and NASA shirts now, not only in the United States, but everywhere. And yeah, NASA played a big role. I mean, I think, I, I don't know if there's a resurgence of NASA, but there's certainly a lot of excitement about space and NASA is certainly in the middle of that. But I have to believe that companies uh, like uh, Boeing, like Lockheed Martin, like Airbus, but also like SpaceX and Blue Origins and, and Ball Aerospace have played a major role because I think what people are seeing now, it's a robust enterprise. And then you add the new space, the entrepreneurial spirit of these imaging satellite constellations and people thinking about how do we mine asteroids and things like that. Um, you know, as a professor of almost 30 years, I can tell you our students are just excited about the possibility of saving humanity, making the earth a better place, doing really cool, exciting things. So when you ask what is the role of the University of Michigan, I could point to the research we do and the, the missions we do and the plasma drives we develop, but absolutely the most important thing we do is workforce development. It's bringing in students who maybe at an early age did not see themselves as future engineers and scientists through our outreach activities, taking really incredibly bright and valuable people uh, like Joan, bringing them to the College of Engineering, who are incredibly great already and making sure we do no harm, but hopefully we actually improve uh, their engineering skills, et cetera. And then we send them to the world to people like Thomas and Deborah to do really great things. That's the role that Michigan Engineering and the University of Michigan uh, plays best, um, developing really great citizens of the world. And, you know, maybe I can add to that from, from an industry standpoint that, uh, you know, we tend to think about the smaller companies as getting all the, the press time for being the ones who are innovative. And there's a lot of innovation and startup culture within larger companies as well. Uh, in fact, one of the things that that brought me to Airbus U.S. Space and Defense is that we're like a startup within a larger company. I mean, certainly people in the aero industry know Airbus for the commercial aircraft side, and then the space community, our, our contributions with uh, the European Space Agency and the International Space Station, human space flight, uh, et cetera. And in the US, we are a little bit newer and lesser known. And as it turns out, the company has had a helicopter business in the US for over 50 years. And over 60% of the helicopters in, uh, used by the US Army, for example, are made by, uh, by Airbus. In fact, when SpaceX's crew uh, landed and they were transported by helicopter back to um, land from their recovery ship was an Airbus helicopter, who, who would know? And on, on the space side, our US company really just started coming together about a year ago with focus on how to take some of the technologies and great history that we have across the company and bringing that more into the US and into uh, some of the missions that are on the national security side with our partnership with OneWeb 
for small satellites that are for OneWeb's constellation that we now can apply. Those are built in Florida at a fabulous factory that can now be applied for other government kinds of, uh, of missions. And we also have a group in Houston that has been supporting NASA Johnson for years and are uh, developing the Bartolomeo platform, which is all, um, already on space station. That's the picture um, behind me. And that's a private investment by Airbus uh, for that platform. And we're developing a, uh, an interface for that for multiple payloads that's coming out of our Houston group. So there's a lot of innovation that goes uh, uh, and I apologize a little bit for an Airbus ad, but just to give an example of innovation that comes from large companies, um, but in a small environment. And I think that's going on throughout our industry in, in many fields where the contributions across industry are so strong and our partnerships with universities are essential. That's where our workforce comes from. That's why we volunteer. I serve on the industrial advisory board for the aero department um, and those connections to students, to research, to innovation, how we can bring those in um, to work together in a broader ecosystem are super exciting. Of course, I'm biased for the Michigan relationship. Uh, there's, there's others as well. Um, but it's a, it's a, I think we do in our U of M community a fabulous job of connecting public and private um, uh, partnerships with uh, across multiple countries as well. That's great, and uh, I, I I can't fault you for liking Michigan. <laughs> you know, it's uh, as long as we uh, are working together when we're solving problems. I just want to end here with uh, Rosina. I think uh, with the hurricane about to slam into uh, the cone is going to. It includes uh, New Orleans again, you know, and the wildfires out west you mentioned, and the nation's first mega drought going on in the southwest, and all the rain that we get in uh, the Great Lakes now that's uh, filled our lakes to the brim and then some. Um, what's really important it seems is that we have, to, we have to empower practitioners, people at the local community level. And I wonder, uh, Rosina, how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna get industry and academia to work together to really uh, ensure that the practitioners out there, the stakeholders uh, at whatever scale and not just in the US have what they need? Uh, I think that's a very important question, Peck. I think we too often in the ivory tower think of, you know, ideal solutions, um, whereas those who are trying to practice in the federal government or in city planning and development agencies internationally have to implement something feasible. And so I think bringing the community, the academic and the practitioner communities together so that we're actually answering questions of most value to those trying to uh, implement drought mitigation plans in Zimbabwe or stormwater management in Ann Arbor or urban planning in Detroit, get the information that they can actually use. And, and I think scientists and engineers need to develop usable information that can advise on wise next steps right now, even while we are trying to get answers to remaining science and technology uncertainties. Uh, just one short story, since Thomas told us stories, that first national climate assessment that you mentioned, um, I was a Fed then, we proudly produced the average changing summer ozone levels during the growing season and gave them to the farmers. And they said, well, that's not much use to us. What we would have liked you to give us was the changing temperature at corn tasseling time. And oh, science can provide that. We just didn't ask them. We should ask them. And, and so I think that very simple set of communication um, and the town gown relationships, I think are very important when you start to look at city and state adaptation and mitigation plans. We have the power to convene and people are not nervous about sitting down in universities from, from industry and from government, et cetera, to start experimenting with, you know, what kind of future do you want? Where are you at now? How is, for example, climate change going to overlay all those concerns that you already have and are getting worse? And then how can we tackle it together? So I, I think a, a big lesson to scientists is, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good enough to begin to make progress. And we've got to learn to create usable information for practitioners and ask them what they need. Thanks. 
I couldn't agree more. And I think what's really exciting to me being at the University of Michigan is that uh, schools, deans, professors, students across the entire campus are really starting to work together uh, to solve some of these biggest problems facing humanity. Um, because I think it is a workforce development issue and I'm glad to hear you say that. And that's something public universities can do like no others in terms of just quantity of really high quality uh, workers uh, and problem solvers and innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, and a lot of this is happening at the intersection of our school and environment and sustainability and engineering. Uh, so I'm really happy to be able to have taken uh, a role in this, in this discussion tonight. I think we're, we're wrapping up and we have maybe one more question um, does anyone have something that they just really got to say in two minutes uh, before we turn it over to Mike again? Uh, Thomas, you've done a great job at convincing me that NASA's on the right track. Uh, Rosine, I really appreciate you telling us uh, quite a bit about what's going on in saving the planet. I think this decade is going to be the biggest decade uh, going forward. We have a governor in Michigan who really wants to go net zero. So we now have the state, we have the town of Ann Arbor, we have the county of Washtenaw County, and we have the U of M all with net uh, zero commitments. That's going to be really exciting, but they're going to need Michigan to figure out how to do it, i.e. University of Michigan. Uh, we have Deborah convincing us that, you know, the private sector is going to be playing a, a big role and they really want to do it with academia, which I think is exciting. And that your comment, uh, Rosina, about this, is, this isn't just about science, this is about useful science. How do we make it useful? So I think this is terrific. And so with that, um, Mike, do you wanna uh, take it over here in the next phase of this? I just wanna thank everybody for this uh, wonderful conversation and everybody who's been listening and uh, please uh, go blue. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to echo the thanks um, for everybody for joining today.